Hello and welcome back to my RC channel. I'm Andy RC and today I'm going to be talking about antennas for the HD Digital DJI FPV system. So the big question is, what antennas should you upgrade to? Because in our great RC hobby, we like to modify and improve. But there is some bad news because unfortunately the boring and very unpopular answer to what antennas you should be using is the stock DJI antennas. Now don't worry I'm going to go all rogue later but let me explain. This is what is inside one of the four antennas on the DJI Digital HD FPV goggles. And just as the specs say, you can see that it's an RPSMA left-hand polarized antenna. And when some of the community heard about this arrangement, they were outraged because when it comes to hobby grade antennas, it's about a 70-30 split in favour of right hand polarisation and you only really see RPSMA on cheap video transmitters or goggles. So without any context, you could easily come to the conclusion that this is DJI forcing you to buy their antennas and in a way you would be correct but not for the right reasons. DJI is often compared to Apple, but there are a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that force them to make decisions like this. One of the things that make the DJI digital system the current best HD FPV product on the market is that it's incredibly complex. And one of the factors that makes it work so well is because the FPV goggles transmit and receive data from the top two antennas using various different techniques which I'll get into later. This presents a problem for DJI because they want to sell this product all over the world but a device that transmits microwave frequencies close to your head has to comply with a set of standards just like mobile phones do. For example in America the transmitting antennas have to comply with the FCC's Code of Federal Regulation 15.203, very catchy name, I know, which states an intentional radiator, also known as a transmitting antenna, shall be designed to ensure that no antenna other than that furnished by the responsible party also known as DJI, shall be used with the device. The use of a permanently attached antenna or of an antenna that uses a unique coupling to the intentional radiator shall be considered sufficient to comply with the provisions of this section. The manufacturer may design the unit so that a broken antenna can be replaced by the user. There's also a clause in there that DJI has to state in their manual that only stock antennas are to be used and the user is responsible for attaching the correct antenna. And if you look in the DJI manual, it does state that. And it's the same rules for Canada's governing body. So the actual truth about DJI's antenna choice is that they did it to be compliant. And while RPSMA and left-hand polarization is not exactly a unique coupling, it's inconvenient enough to get certified as well as the MMCX left-hand polarized antennas on the air unit. So while it seemed like you were being forced to buy DJI's antennas, as long as you use antennas with the same gain as the originals you are still compliant. The CE marking is a little bit different for Europe though. The CE logo on the goggles means that it complies with European safety and environmental standards. So the gain of the stock antennas has passed what the EU deems as safe exposure to low powered microwaves close to a person's head. However, it's my understanding that if the user decides to switch out the antennas, they are not breaking the law like you would be if you changed it under the FCC 
standards and Canada's regulations. They are, however, using the device outside of the manufacturer's guidelines, making the device no longer CE compliant. So they are putting the risk on the user. So to cut a long story short, technically, you shouldn't be switching out any of the antennas because globally, the stock antennas have been deemed safe to use and switching them for anything else could be considered a health hazard in the EU or be out outside the laws of your country. The same goes for the air unit. So that's the fun stuff out of the way. But in reality, everybody wants more range or better penetration through objects, especially in countries where the power output is limited to 25 milliwatt and you want to stick to the law. But I just wanted to mention that technically you should be officially using the stock antennas and the reasons why that is. Now, I've been lucky enough to have direct contact with DJI on this subject. I've even had Skype calls with them. However, the digital transmit and receive world is so much more complex than the analog world. Just Googling it will give you a headache. And that's not even taken into consideration the digital signal processing that goes on either. So, I'll tell you the methods that they have used to transmit and receive data, then you can go and look them up and hopefully your head won't explode. The top two antennas of the goggles and both antennas on the air unit transmit and receive data between the two seamlessly at the same time, but they do it using a technique called time division duplexing. This is a method that sends and receives data by allocating time slots on the same frequency separated by something called a guard time so that the transmit and receive signals never clash. Of course, it does this very fast. In fact, if I use my power meter on either the goggles or the air unit, it won't show the proper power output because the span of my power meter can only measure as low as 10 milliseconds, whereas the transmit and receive data along with the guard time is switching faster than that. Interestingly, I discovered that the goggles only start transmitting when the air unit is plugged in. So the goggles must listen for the signal to be received from the air unit before it starts transmitting back. So as long as the air unit is turned off, then you can power up the goggles without the antennas on. The air unit, however, transmits as soon as you plug the battery in. So make sure that the antennas are always attached to the air unit when it's powered up. Using time division duplexing or TDD means that they don't have to use separate channels to send and receive data. So when you look at it on a band scanner, it takes up the same amount of space as an analog FPV signal. Now that's the simple way of explaining it, believe it or not. It's also using orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, or OFDM for short, which is a way of modulating data on sub-frequencies that are bunched up very close together, again, to take up less space in the band, along with a method called multiple input and multiple output, or MIMO for short, which can be used in many different ways. And if your head hasn't already exploded by now, they are also using something called cyclic delay diversity, which is a way of transforming spatial diversity into frequency diversity to avoid intersymbol interference. So I'll let you go ahead and Google all of that and see if you find it fun. Interestingly, those methods have been around for years as they are the same methods used for mobile telecommunications as well as Wi-Fi. So what I'm going to do is tell you what seems to be the best antenna setups, plural, and then discuss why that might be from the information I've just given you. And then you guys can give your ideas in the comments. I'm going to start off with the air unit antennas because it's an easy one. I haven't found any significant difference swapping them out at all, and that's because the difference in gain from an omni antenna is never going to be that significant. Interestingly, linear antennas seem to produce good results, which could be down to all of the transmit and receive methods that they are using, which I just mentioned. 
First of all, if you are using the full power output, whether that's 700 milliwatts or the 1200 milliwatt mod, and are flying within line of sight, perhaps around a couple of trees or around the exterior of a couple of buildings, then you aren't going to notice a significant difference switching from the stock antennas anyways, because trees aren't that dense and flying around buildings doesn't cause too many issues until you start flying inside them or through them. However, if you are flying on 25 milliwatts in that same location, then the True RC X Air antennas make a significant improvement to the range bitrate and latency. There's a couple of problems with them though. They cost an absolute fortune and they are directional. So unless you are flying in front of yourself, you'll have to move your head towards the general direction of your quadcopter, which you can easily get wrong because you can't see where it is. You're looking through the goggles. I think it's safe to say that with any antenna setup, flying on 25 milliwatt through the full length of a bando is out of the question. You'd have to physically stand in each part of the bando and then cut a video together, but the same goes for analog in that situation. What does seem to be odd is that when you set everything to full power and use all patch antennas at a bando, flying through multiple buildings while standing outside of that building, whether you use the true RC antennas or four individual patch antennas like the Menace Picos, the performance is similar to or worse than using all stock DJI antennas. And this was discovered by David FPV, who is a Menace pilot. And it turned out that using the two stock Omni DJI antennas at the top and two of the Pico patch antennas on the bottom was the ideal setup for a bando and gave the best results. I haven't had the chance to take this setup to a proper bando yet, however this setup seems to give the best consistent performance for most situations. So it's the setup that I'm currently using and if you are a hardcore bando guy with a DJI system then give this setup a try and let me know what you think. I'm even considering the Menace Periscope antennas for the top two antennas because getting the antennas above your head has made a massive difference to my analog setup. And of course, it's not as convenient as having four stubbies, but there are some extreme bandos here in the UK, or should I say derelict buildings, that I want to fly with this system at some point. Oh, and if you do buy the Menace Pico patch antennas, then make sure you get the extension adapters. The same goes for analog, because for some reason, getting the patch antenna slightly away from the goggle makes them perform better, and you can also experiment angling them in different directions. So, if you don't care about the technicalities of why this setup seems to work the best for me, then just give it a try for yourself, because the Menace antennas don't break the bank like the true RC antennas do and make sure that on the air unit both antennas are the same and they are omnidirectional whether it be linear or polarized the same goes for the top two antennas on the goggles because they work together unlike a traditional analog diversity system which relies on using different antennas because it switches between the two. The bottom two antennas on the DJI goggles just receive, but again, they work together, so it's best to keep the gains the same, therefore it's best to keep the antennas both the same. Unfortunately, DJI wasn't fully willing to explain why the bottom two antennas only receive. They only mentioned that they worked together. I imagine that it's either too complicated or they don't want to give away all of their magic. My uneducated guess would be that it's better to have more receiving antennas to collect data from the air unit than it is to transmit back 
to the air unit. It might also explain why using four patch antennas on the goggles when flying through a bando produces worse results than the stock DJI Omnis because when you up the gain of the top receivers, you're also up in the gain of the transmitters. So the air unit is using lower gain omnidirectional antennas to transmit its signal back to the goggles. But the goggles with their patch antennas are transmitting at a higher gain back to the air unit. So perhaps this is causing some kind of interference, whether it's reflections or something else. But at the end of the day, I don't think it's something DJI are going to be able to tell us because they are bound by the laws and regulations. So it's in their interest as well as ours to comply with this amazing product that they've been able to get certified and released. And I think they're making it hard for the naysayers now because not only have they fixed the initial analog input issues, you can now use the DVR to record analog at 60 FPS at a quality that is way better than any other FPV goggle on the market. And it doesn't seem to drop frames, which has opened up the possibility for non-destructive add-ons such as the UR UAV analog attachment where you can add any after aftermarket analog module. They also have most of the Betaflight on-screen display icons working now as well. And you can get a subtitle file which you can overlay in post-production. So they're not only sticking to their word, but they are exceeding everybody's expectations. You can now buy a better faceplate that are more comfortable and sort out the light leak problem that the goggles initially had. And they have released diopters so I don't need to worry about my glasses scratching the screens anymore. And if that isn't enough, all of the initial talk about DJI locking everybody into their ecosystem has been crushed by the announcement of the Cadex Vista, which is a 32 gram VTX for people who just want the digital FPV feed or want to install it on a smaller copter. So, I'm a big fan of everything that DJI are currently doing. Despite that, I still love analog just as much. In fact, I like to space out my DJI videos because I still think there will always be a place for analog. We should just be excited that these things are progressing in every direction, whether it's HD or analog. And the only thing that we need to fight are these silly regulations. And on that note, I'll leave it there. So as always, thanks so much for watching. Please continue to subscribe. Cheers.